penultimate panel. Um, uh, paper by uh, Will Bowd. Will Bowd. Um, haven't really gone into uh, introductions, but since Will is um, obscure, not in the <laughs> academy yet, um, I, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about him. Uh, very briefly, he's a graduate of the Yale Law School. He clerked for Judge Mike McConnell and then Chief Justice Roberts. Um, so that's your grand introduction. <laughs> uh, Will Bow. Okay. Th thank you. So. So my paper looks at a slightly different aspect of originalism than the others that have been presented here, in that my paper is not a substantive originalism paper. It's not about the original meaning of a particular provision of the Constitution, nor is it exactly a methodological paper, in that for the most part, although with, with some exceptions, I, I don't try to defend one particular version of originalism, textualism versus intentionalism, and, and those fights we've been having today. And, to have. So instead, I'm looking at a question of how the originalist methodology has evolved and whether, whether the kinds of originalist methodologies we have create problems for originalism, both as, as a theoretical matter and as a practical matter. Um, so the first thing I have to do in the paper is establish uh, maybe the, the obvious point to everybody here, but that there are a huge variety of different scholarly theories that all travel under the banner of originalism. Uh, surely this is not news to people who've been sitting through the panels we've been having, but the, the sort of the extent of the disarray is, is pretty staggering. Um, first of all, there's a very wide variety of theories about why originalism is the correct method of interpretation. Uh, I divide them into two basic categories, uh, sort of conceptual justifications, that's the word I, I use, uh, and consequentialist justifications. And the conceptual justifications all have the trait that they, <clears throat> they attempt to derive the correctness of originalism from some kind of basically philosophical first principles. Uh, so one big variety are linguistic theories that say, you know, what is it to read a text? What is it to, what is it to read a text? What is it to communicate with a certain set of people? What does that require? And then people fight about whether that requires a form of intentionalism or a form of textualism and original public meaning. And, and, but that's all a set of a very conceptual linguistic justifications. Then there's the sort of the next step of justifications, which, which have a little bit more of a political philosophy, but still a very philosophical flavor to them. Namely, they attempt to derive the correctness of originalism from principles about, about what it is to, to have popular sovereignty or to, to, to have democratic legitimacy or you know, what, what it means that we wrote down the Constitution and ratified it as a people. And then there are the, the set of justifications that are what I call consequentialist, which don't attempt to justify originalism just on those bases, but instead look to the results it actually produces either on a case-by-case -case basis or on a systematic basis and argue that that is why we should be originalists. So maybe it's because we just like limited federal power, assuming the Constitution creates limited federal power and a certain set of rights, and those are all good, and you know, because those are good and originalism gives us those, we should be originalists. Or maybe there's some more systematic benefits to originalism, like the chief one and the one I, I sort of spend the most time thinking about is, is that it constrains interpretation in some way. Uh, maybe it constrains it a lot, maybe it constrains it a little, maybe it'll turn out that it fails to do that, but that's a, a, one of the major sort of selling points for originalism is this is the way that judges will be able to do something other than just make it up as they go along, or this is what will be able to rein in willful judges, uh, et cetera. Okay, so you've got all that state of disarray, and then uh, in addition to that, sort of, there's the, there's the second order fight about what originalism entails, whatever Gill's reasons are. And those we've, we've seen already, and I won't, I won't sort of repeat most of them, but, you know, is it intent? Is it text? If it is intent, whose intent is it? If it is the text, how do we interpret it? And what do we do with certain kinds of interpretive principles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, then is it positive? Is it normative? Is it both? Are the positive and normative you know, in dialogue or something? Uh, that's a whole other set of, of questions about you know, what originalism actually, how it works out. Um, so then you know, you've, got, you've got that sort of giant mess in the scholarship, or a giant sort of set of disagreements in the scholarship. And then you contrast all that with how original is practiced. And I focus on judges because, for better or worse, that's where lawyers and even you know, non-governmental actors often take their cues. 
Uh, so how does originalism work in practice? And, and it you know, works at a much less theoretically sophisticated level. Um, for the most part, you know, it's rare to see judicial opinions that sort of explicitly draw on originalism, although there is a consistent and important theme that they do. Uh, but when they do, they, they don't get into you know, most of the important theoretical questions that scholars, or maybe they're important, maybe they're not, questions that scholars fight about. Uh, and much more often, or so I argue, originalism actually influences the, the direction of doctrine or the, the direction judges want to take something, not because they even explicitly apply originalism, but because it, it leads them to rein in doctrines that are sort of totally unjustifiable as a matter of original meaning. And then there's definitely no discussion of you know, intent, public meaning, or any of the, any of the questions that, that you think are important. So, so you've got this giant uh, difference between originalism in theory and originalism in practice. Uh, and of course, even in, in originalism in theory, there are many other differences. Uh, and that's that's what I call impure originalism. So in, originalism, as it is practiced, is, is you know not at all the the kind of theoretical enterprise that any individual originalist scholar anticipates. So then the question is: This is a problem? Uh, is this a problem? Because you know the natural the natural thing you might believe is that it is uh, that you know they're supposed to be sort of the same enterprise. And on the one hand, you seem to have judges who are failing to practice real originalism or maybe even practicing it in ways that is directly at odds with what it's theoretically supposed to do. And on the other hand, you have academics who are creating theories that judges don't want or can't use or you know uh, don't want or can't use. So uh, my answer is no, it's not a problem. At least 70%, 75% of the time, it's not a problem. Uh, as for the complaint that judges are sort of, <clears throat> as for the complaint that even originalist judges are impure or theoretically unsophisticated or you know just don't just don't get or won't do the kind of originalism that that uh, advanced originalist scholars know to be correct, I think that that's not really that's not really right, and it, it, in particular it misses the the important institution different institutional role that courts have. Uh, there are impurities in how originalist judges apply originalism, but the impurities come from stare decisis, which may or may not be right as a matter of original meaning, and that's a that's a fight to have. But if it is, if there is some sort of role for precedent in uh, original meaning, then that that's sort of just part of how judges you know, judges how judges apply it. Uh, and even more importantly, I think a big difference is uh, is the party presentation principle. Judges don't even judges don't in, in any case just sort of engage in a free-ranging uh, search for what they think the sort of what they want to say about the law. They decide cases that are brought to them and they decide on the legal issues that are brought to them and they decide to take. And the vast majority of the time nobody asks them to or demands that they sort of take on sort of originals, original meaning and so it so it's largely sinks under the radar in, in just the way I described. Um, as for a different charge against judges, which is that they sort of practice originalism in a way that destroys originalism. This is a, a claim by Robert Post and Riva Siegel, an article there was a few years ago. Uh, and the idea is that <clears throat> when originalist judges do overrule precedent or move doctrine back towards original meaning where it hasn't been before, you know, they are changing the Constitution in a way that is at war with the idea that originalism produces some sort of fixed, unchanging constitution. Well, that's just silly. Uh, you know, what they are doing is changing what the cases say, but the whole premise of, of a look at original meaning is that, what the, that the constitution has its own meaning, which isn't necessarily what the cases say. Uh, so it's actually exactly what they're supposed to be doing when, when judges sort of bring doctrine slowly back towards the original meaning where it's, where it's supposed to be. And then there are the academics, uh, and the complaint that you know the scholarship is useless or counterproductive for various reasons that we can get into when we get to the questions. You know, I think it's not useless. It actually does produce distinctions that are important in a few cases, and it's definitely not counterproductive either. Um, and then, <clears throat> but so despite all that, then the question is: Is everything fine? You know, is this just a, a you know ra radical defense of the conventional wisdom? And then I, in, the, in the part of the paper I'm working on, uh, sort of the least worked out, I do have a few concerns about the relationship between originalist theory and practice that I think, that I think cause some, force some caution among different kinds of originalists. So for, for those who are of the sort of strongly conceptual stripe, uh, the worry I think is, is that originalism will sort of prove itself to be very valid but also very trivial. 
uh, the more originalism retreats from being any kind of claim about any kind of normative claim of what people should do, and it's purely a positive claim, or the more it uses sort of very abstract ideas about semantic contribution, uh, you know, the more it's just not going to tell us anything useful at all about how to decide any actual cases. And since there are a lot of actual cases that matter to lawyers, that, that, that's a problem. Uh, on the flip side, the versions of originalism that uh, are the most consequentialist and that, that promise actual results uh, the risk is that that has a sort of a, a corrupting influence in particular cases because if you've, if you've subscribed to original because it does something good, then in any given case you're going to have a, an incentive to sort of push your, your historical analysis or your legal analysis in a way to, to deliver on what you promise. So if your originalism is supposed to constrain judges, you might take what are supposed to be open textured provisions of the Constitution and make them too rule-like. If your originalism is supposed to just produce sort of good and legitimate results, then sometimes when the Constitution produces something unpalatable, you'll be tempted to, to instead find some way to make it produce a more, a more palatable result. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the, right, what the right way to deal with each of these problems is, maybe other than, than paying attention to them and, and you know, <clears throat> be watchdogs, but that, that is the sort of the one potential dark side to an originalist theory in practice.